Everyone wants to live an inspired life, yet so many people search for happiness following the footsteps of peers and taking advice from people who have different values and outcomes to which they're searching. There are people born into wealth, graduated from the best universities in the world, and there are people who have none of that and yet are living extraordinary lives full of fulfillment and reward. The purpose of this podcast is to share insights and strategies that allow you to question the status quo and think freely, so you can design your life and be who you want to be. We get one life. Time is our most valuable asset. I believe that when we're free and able to focus on meaningful work, we become better human beings. This is Always Free, and I'm your host, Jason Greystone. Welcome to the leading podcast for financial empowerment and wealth creation. Subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss an episode. You can connect with Jason on social media and subscribe to the Jason Greystone YouTube channel for weekly videos. Don't forget to also subscribe to the weekly newsletter to receive frequent educational content and action steps to help you design your life so you can be who you want to be. For news on all future events and updates, go to jasongreystone.com. Well, 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 welcome back to the podcast, guys. Hope you've had a good week. Been an absolute manic week for me. Just got back from uh, Las Vegas. Um, I did a, actually did a podcast from in Las Vegas last week, so check that out. It was a bit, bit delirious, but I stayed in the UK time, so I always find it best. If I'm going for three days to the US, it's usually best just to stay in UK time. So I ended up going to bed at 5 p.m., getting up at 1 a.m., rock and roll, eh? Um, But welcome to the podcast. If this is the first time you're listening, it's the number one podcast, the number one for financial empowerment and wealth creation and designing your life to be who you want to be to achieve a level of financial independence that allows you to experience the things that you need to experience in life for you and your loved ones and basically be the best human being you can possibly be. So If you haven't listened to all the others, I highly recommend you go back to the beginning and start there because there's a lot of strategies in this podcast throughout the series uh, that's kind of in order. So you need to kind of start at the beginning. And plus, uh, if you go right back to the beginning, it will be an introduction to me and you'll be what you know, you'll realize, well, who, why the hell should I listen to this guy? Um, and, And you'll just get a bit more of a connection, hopefully. Um, so in this, in this, uh, particular, episode I kind of threw out some questions this week been very busy on the social I've, I've been doing a lot of Q&A uh, particularly on Instagram and if you if you don't follow me on Instagram it's j underscore graystone uh, there's a lot of fake accounts of me but there's uh, my one has about I think it's about 16 and a half thousand followers something like that and you can <clears throat> go and check out my highlights because I saved them all to the highlights but I was talking about leverage this week and I was kind of talking about the good and bad of leverage. I was talking about mortgages and property and things like that. And I wanted to kind of throw all that into this this, uh, particular episode of Always Free. I don't know how long it's going to take, but I've got a few things I want to talk about. And the first thing is leverage, okay? Now, I've spoken about debt to income ratio before. First of all, we're talking about debts, okay? Because the, the, the level of debt that you're in and the level of things that you're paying back each month and I kind of spoke about how that's directly correlated to how you feel and how you're going to treat your staff and colleagues and, uh, you know, work friends and friends and family and your job. And, and we went through the debt to income ratio uh, earlier on in the week on social media. But essentially, it's adding up all of your debts, OK, credit cards, bank loans, all, all of the debts that you're paying uh, um, each month and dividing it by your income per month and then multiplying by 100 and that will give you a percentage and basically you know if it's low if it's below 10 percent, it's excellent if it's 10 to 20 percent, it's very good if it's 20 to 30 percent, you're kind of you, you want to you're cautious if it's 30 to 40 percent, you're kind of just a little bit leveraged up okay you're a bit um you know you want to consider stopping 50 to 75 percent um or 40 to 50 percent you're actually stretched 50 to 75% you're stressed and 75% to 100% you are absolutely working for the bank. And then obviously there's above 100% and you know that's what the hell are you doing? You need to kind of sort that out and 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 get that, get rid of those debts. But then we were kind of going on to leverage. You know, when is a good time to uh use leverage? And it's obviously a double-edged sword. So I want to kind of talk about that. 
And I want to talk a little bit about mortgages and when to buy a house and renting versus buying and uh, when you might consider renting and when you might consider buying. And I also want to talk about something uh, called price to rent ratio. So as with everything with this podcast, it's all about d- designing your life and being who you want to be, questioning the status quo, uh, actually doing the numbers, seeing if what someone's told you aligns with what your mission is on life and not and basically breaking the mold you know doing what you want to do and the pr- the price to rent ratio I went through this I got a question you know are you going to be buying your house or renting your house the next one and it all had to do with basically whether or not it aligned with my financial goals and there's a there's a formula that you can use called price to rent and essentially what you do is you uh, weigh up the cost of the house, okay, and you divide that by the annual rental cost. So you do the house price divided by the annual rental cost of a house of that same, uh, you know, the same size house. So if you're looking at a five hundred thousand pound house and you find the rent is twenty five grand, you do five hundred divided by twenty five, and you'll get a you'll get a, a percentage again, okay, and basically if that answer to that question is below fifteen. I would definitely, definitely buy for financial reasons, okay? If it's between 15 and 25, I would then consider, I would have to be, do a bit more investigation work, okay? I'd have to weigh up the longer term goals, you know, the family goals, the financial goals, the financial situation, and really do some more in-depth work on whether or not we buy or rent. But anything above 25, um, I would definitely rent for financial reasons. It literally wouldn't make sense for me to, to own a house if that number was over 25. So, for instance, at the moment, we're looking at a, a house. Um, we're liquidating the house because we're just about to go into a recession. And I, want to, I want to be cashed up. I want, I'm getting as much cash as I can so that I can make as much money as I can in the recession. So... We're looking for another property, okay? Now, that doesn't mean that we will still buy or rent, okay? It depends what's best financially because I'll still want... There's a chance I could still get some liquidity and still... You know, it all depends on this number. So, for instance, at the moment, we're looking at a house that's around a million pounds, okay? The house that I'm in was about 1.2... Um, it, or it's worth 1.2 million. Um, we've actually had an offer on this house for 1.2 million. And the place that we're looking at is about a million, million pound house. But the, the price to rent that same place, okay, or a house exactly like that would be 48,000. In fact, it's just under 48,000. Okay, so when you do a million divided by 48,000, you get 20, which puts us bang in the middle of that formula of 15 to 25. So I'm in the process of doing a bit more investigation work, seeing how I can kind of shift investments and do other things. And we're just basically going to weigh it up. You know, what's the pros or the cons? What's the, what's the, everyone's vote, basically. And most people don't go about doing that kind of thing. Most people don't take the time to actually go and do these calculations, which is why they end up frustrated. And they seem to think that buying a house is the only way to live in a property, but it isn't. Listen, you're here for a long time. It might make sense to just rent part time, you know, just rent for a couple of years. It might make sense to rent for five, six years, 10 years. Um, It might make sense to buy and then sell and then rent. It, It just you just need to know what the objectives are, what your mission is, and just make decisions that aligned with your mission. Not taking advice from other people, you know, people down the pub, your mates at work. Um, and it's just ridiculous because all you'll do is end up frustrated. And second to that, the prices of how ha- uh, buying a house is a speculation. <laughs> buying a house is a pure speculation. If you think it's a safe, passive investment, it's not. It's not. You know, you've still got to sell the thing. There's a lot of stress with that. There's a lot of repairs and costs that go into it that people seem to just brush under the carpet. And the price that you pay for a house, look, for me, for instance, £1.2 million house, the house that we're looking at is better than the house I'm in, and it's less. So you need to... Warren Buffett, actually, Warren Buffett's very famous uh, for, for saying, one of his rules for investing, he says that the price is what you pay... 
and the value is what you get. Okay, and you need to understand that they're two very, very different things because the price of anything, okay, even in stock market, uh, even in, you know, in economics, in house prices, the price is just what you pay. It's nothing to do with the value you get. The price is dictated by the market, okay, the emotions, the fear, the greed, the bubbles, okay, the, the prices of anything is just inflated or deflated, and when you buy something, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's valued correctly. It could be undervalued or overvalued, and that's where the price to rent ratio comes in, because it's a good way of quickly assessing whether you're paying uh, an undervalued or inflated price. So you need to understand the difference between those two, and it's it's exactly the same in the property market. It's no different. So at any one time, you're not necessarily buying a good deal. It does, even if you do value buying, okay, it, and it makes ridiculous sense to to actually uh, buy at that time because the prices are so overinflated. People do that all the time. People do that all the time. And I've spoken about this before. If you've, if you've looked at the video on YouTube, renting versus buying, uh, just, just type into YouTube, uh, buying versus renting or buying or renting by Jason Greystone. And I did an investigation on this. I literally went down the high street, asked people. I went into uh, the most reputable estate agents here in East Grinstead. I went into Barclays Bank. I got all the figures. I came home. I crunched the numbers. And I'll go through, I'll go through a little bit of that in this episode. But I've basically spoken about it you know, many times before. And I've also spoken about using real estate investment trusts. You can actually go and own property without owning physical bricks and mortar. So if you're that attached to own being in the market, in the property market, but you don't want to buy bricks, then you can go and buy a real estate investment trust. You know, using real estate investment trusts basically allow you to get into the property market without having a mortgage or a loan or having to deal with any tenants or anything like that. And, it, and they give similar returns, if not even better. But you have to understand there's different ways to be in the property market, okay? And there's going to be dead money in all of them. There's dead money in all of them. I think I worked out that the average house price around here was about 452 grand, okay? And we did some calculations. And by the way, any mortgage will um, charge you basically double the house price. If you're if you look at your mortgage statement now, it will say total repayments. If you, let's just say you've got a thirty year mortgage, um, it will say total uh, mortgage repayments something three hundred and sixty payments something like that over thirty years, and you'll be paying almost double what the house costs. So that will probably you know make your jaw hit the floor. But essentially, a four point nine percent five percent mortgage, you're going to be paying a lot of interest first, and the way that they when we're going back to leverage, I got asked the question, you know, what what do you think about leverage in Forex and what do you think about leverage? And I, I just said, a house is speculation, you know, it's no different from the mortgage lenders giving you a mortgage, that's leverage. They're giving you basically, a, if you've got a 20 grand, 25 grand deposit, and they're giving you a 500 grand mortgage, well, they're giving you leverage of 20 to one almost. Okay, and the reason they want to do that is because that's their product. So they, the way that they win is by getting you to buy the house because once you've bought the house, they know that you're going to probably move every seven to eight years because that's the trend. People get itchy feet every seven to eight years, they move house. So they set up the repayment schedule, the amortization schedule, so that you're paying all of the interest, pure interest and very little uh, principal um, for seven to eight years, and then it starts to pay off more of the principal and less interest. So they're not stupid. And then they know that you're going to do that, and then you're going to sell up, go and do it all again. Start a new mortgage, new 30 years, new blah, 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 blah. And you're going to be doing this forever. And the only people that win is the banks. So of course they want to, they give you leverage, you know? And it's the same with Forex, same with all the rest of it. But when we did this kind of example, we worked out that you're going to, first of all, you're going to be paying back probably double what the house is worth. We worked out that there's dead ways to to be in the property market, dead money. Okay. You're going to have dead money in all ways. If you went and forked out, you know, if you went and forked out 450 grand on a house, say cash, let's just say you paid for it cash, which in my opinion is the most stupid thing you can do unless you're an absolute billionaire. Um, and it represents 1% of your entire liquidity, 
you're going to have some losses because you've dumped a load of cash into a house, which you're now sacrificing uh, passive income from investment returns. So I think I worked it out to be about three and a half grand or 3,700 per month in lost income if you was to buy a house in cash of 450 grand. And then also, if you was going to go and get a mortgage, you'd be paying around two and a half grand per month. And most of that is interest and a very little amount of it is capital, about 500 uh, principal, sorry. Um, and then if you was to go and rent a house, it would cost about 1300 per month. So actually renting was the cheapest way to go and do that. But then there's real estate investment trusts. So if you feel like you wanted to be in the market and you didn't necessarily want to buy bricks and didn't really care about buying bricks, well, real estate investment trusts, you know, they're far more diversified, they're far more secure, they're far more liquid. You can get your money back in two seconds, two clicks of a button, two days maximum, sorry, you'll, you'll have your money in your, your account. You just click the button, you sell, two days, it's in your, uh, it's in your account. And you can also use pound cost averaging or dollar cost averaging, as I've been over before. And what that is, is essentially buying frequently, whether the market's going up or down, and you approximate the mean price of the growth of that market. So the actual principle alone allows you not to care what the market's doing. You don't care. When you use dollar cost averaging or pound cost averaging, you just don't care what the market's doing. If the market goes down, brilliant, right? You're buying every single month and it means you can get more for a cheaper price. It, it, it baffles me at how many people go for two for one deals in the supermarket, but when the stock market goes down and halves, no one wants to buy. <laughs> That's a two for one deal, right? I want to buy as many as I can. I want to bulk up. I want to buy in bulk. And it's the same with real estate investment trusts. And the other thing is when you invest that way, it's absolutely stress-free. Okay, you're not trying to pick the right time to enter. You're not concerned about a crash coming. You're just continuously buying and buying and buying and accumulating more and more and more of the market. And you don't care if it's going up or down. And the entire investment's liquid. Okay, there's no worry about mortgages or loans or debts or interest rates. And you get a dividend every quarter. <laughs> you know, to me, that's proper leveraged income. And this was a discussion we had this week. Some people were saying, uh, they were trying to say that basically they don't need to worry because when they get a mortgage, they only need to put down 20%. But the question is, what do you use leverage for? Everyone thinks they've got to use leverage. They want to use leverage, but no one really asks why. And no one really sees buying a house as being a speculation. So if you do see it as a speculation, when you think about it, when you think about leverage, people want to use leverage to get rich quick. Most people want to use leverage to get rich quick. Now, I use leverage, okay, but for the right reasons. Most people want to use leverage in the first place to get a quick return, okay? They want to buy something, hope that it's going to go up, and then sell it. That's, that's what they're doing. And obviously, when you're, when you're correct, when you're actually accurate with the timing and the right investment, leverage can make it quicker. But you have to understand that it doesn't give you a competitive advantage, Okay, leverage makes your potential upsides bigger to the same degree that it makes your potential downsides bigger. It's a double-edged sword and they cancel each other out. You know, you've got no competitive advantage. It just makes your entire investment journey volatile. And when you haven't weighed up the risks of the downsides of using leverage and you haven't really earned the right to use it, you're absolutely blinded to that. All you're doing is looking at the upside. So it's more of a speculation than an investment going to buy a house with massive leverage. And the same goes for the Forex market. Same goes for trading, right? If you're a serious or sophisticated investor or you're a developer or a renovator and you're, you've, you've got experience and you know what you're doing, you need leverage and you know what you're doing. And that's completely different. But I'm talking about newbies who aren't getting into investing and they're thinking they need to go and get this leverage. And what they're essentially doing is uh, building an upside down pyramid, right? They save and save and save. They get a little bit of money for a deposit and then that's their equity. And then they get a big amount of debt. And you imagine you're building this kind of pyramid uh, upside down. And no doubt that you'll be pleased when you've doubled your money in a short space of time, but it's only on paper, okay? Unrealized equity growth makes zero difference to your lifestyle until you go and sell the house. That's where people come become frustrated, 
They think, well, this is what I was told to do. I've got the money, it's gone up, the capital growth's gone up. Now what? I'm still going to work every day. And then if you get the investment wrong and you get the timing wrong and the house goes down just a little bit, that makes a big impact on your equity. I know many new investors that have gone straight into negative equity and you know negative net worth. And even if they sold everything they owned, they would be below zero. And what people tell me when they get into this situation is, oh, there's nothing wrong with riding something out as long as it's providing an income. But what you need to know is it doesn't always provide an income. It's not always positively geared, which most investment properties aren't straight off the bat. I know very successful property investors and they say it takes ages to, to break even. You know, unless you go and really add value to it or renovate them all, if it's not positively geared, it's costing you money. And then you're forced to go to work to get an income to pay for an investment that's gone down. So that was never an investment in the first place. It's just a gamble. You never really put any thought into it. The best way, okay, is to think about the pyramid the other way around. You want to build cash foundations, three to six months buffer. Set aside a portion of your income every month to build that foundation, save and save and save. When you've got two to three months worth of living expenses, then you can start making some passive investments, okay, and then... Start building that out, have some money working for you in the market, then you could have some more uh, living expenses working for you, liquid cash working for you in the market, build a bit more of a buffer, and then when you've got some good passive investments going, you have a threshold of leverage, okay? There's this threshold that you reach when you might think about going to use some of your uh, allocation and then go and speculate and accelerate your growth, accelerate your wealth that way. But as I say, most people try and balance the big pyramid upside down, hoping it won't topple over, but that is pointless. It, could, it will probably take longer. It will take longer. The best investors build the pyramid the right way up. And yes, it could potentially take a little bit longer, but you've got to ask yourself this. What do you want in life? You know, why are you investing? You want investments to have a good quality of life. You don't, want, you don't have a good quality of life when you're in fear. And that's essentially what you're doing when you're leveraged up the wrong way. So you can use leverage to your advantage and you can use it to accelerate your growth. But when you're first starting out, most people seem to jump the gun a bit too soon and they've got no liquidity and they go and leverage up and, you know, it all fall, it all ends badly. So hopefully you got something from that. It's a bit of a rant, really. I was kind of on going off on one all over the place, but it's uh, I felt I needed to get that out. It seems to have been the topic of the week this week. Uh, if you've enjoyed it or you think someone needs to hear this information, please share this around. I'd love it if you gave this podcast a review. We've had about two, over 200 ratings and reviews now. Uh, I would love yours. I do share them all in the newsletter every week. And um, if you're interested, if this has resonated with you, um, I'm lo- about to launch the most comprehensive, complete and practical wealth creation program on the planet. OK, I've, after all of these years of attending seminars, boot camps, reading books, years and years and years of studying investments and the markets and the, you know, and economics and in uh, speculation, I've essentially removed everything that you don't need to know and put a step by step guide into everything that will build your pyramid the right way. And it's called Tears of Freedom. Um, if you want to apply just go to a little bit.ly link, okay, bit.ly forward slash uh, tears of freedom apply. And you can just put your application in there. Launching next week. So I'm really excited about that. Um, I really believe it's the most powerful and most um, valuable wealth creation program out there that exists. So I'm really excited to share that with you. So go and do that. Give this a little review and until next week, have a great rest of your day and weekend and I'll see you then. to this podcast so you don't miss an episode. For news on all future events and updates, go to jasongraystone.com.